So, William, it's so great having you here, and I was wondering if you could just explain a little bit about your research and describe the ways in which climate change impacts fish and fisheries. So my research focuses on looking at how climate change is affecting marine ecosystems and particularly fisheries, uh, and also developing projections and scenarios of uh, future change, how different decisions that we are making in terms of policy and the way we fish will affect um, the future sustainability and the climate change. And so can you talk about some of the data that go into that and what type of models you're constructing around that? Mm. A lot of our work focuses on big scale, global scales, we look at the whole global ocean. So we, we rely strongly on data that are already available. Uh, we, for example, for the fishery side, um, we, our colleagues um, have developed a global uh, database of fisheries catch. So that basically is the amount of fish that different fisheries in the world are taking from the oceans in a year. And that data set uh, goes back from 1950 to now and is uh, subdivided into different countries and uh, in different parts of the oceans. That provides us with uh, really rich information about um, the fishing activities as well as the ecology of the animals. At the same time, uh, we use uh, available data sets on the biology of the organisms that tell us about um, the length of the fish, the growth rate of the fish, and where the organisms like to live. Um, we also have information about where the historical records of where some of the species are living. So by combining those information using uh, modeling techniques, uh, statistical modeling, as well as other numerical modeling techniques, we can uh, combine all these uh, information, synthesize them, and tell us something about um, the ecology of the organisms, how they respond to climate change, and how they would affect fisheries. So you just briefly described this data set that involves fish catch, and so maybe you could just explain a little bit more about the Sea Around Us project database. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> the um, United Nations Food and Agriculture Organizations, um, they have uh, maintained a, a global fisheries landing data set. So that's uh, basically collected based on contributions of information from the member countries of the United Nations. So that has so far been really useful, uh, helps to understanding what are the landings, uh, what have been the landings um, in different countries uh, and in the world. However, there, were, uh, there is a, uh, a, a gap in that data set. Uh, for example, um, because of uh, limitations of the country's capacity or because of a large, large uh, range of different reasons, some of the countries may not be able to report all the catch to, um, to uh, the food and agriculture organizations, and thus it's not represented in the landing statistics. So it would then uh, result in the bias uh, ultimately when researchers try to use those information. And the main goal of the CMS project, um, in this case, is try to improve that data set, trying to get a better understanding of how much fish have been taken from the ocean. And that's really reasonable first step to get to understand the effects of human activity on the oceans, because uh, even without a good understanding of how much fish we remove from the oceans, we cannot say for, for sure how it would affect um, the marine ecosystems and fish stocks. So with that, um, my colleagues lead a big team of uh, researchers trying to do something called a catch reconstruction. So we know that there are information that are available out there um, that would allow us to get some estimations of the potential catches, particularly those that are not reported in the United Nations statistics. So my colleagues and his team uh, go country by country, try to collate those information. Some of those information may be in proper literature or publications, but many of those are in something called we call grey literature. So it's like a newsletter or a newspaper, or sometimes with uh, expert opinion. So by contacting uh, colleagues or uh, officials that are working in that countries that have lots of knowledge about that country's fisheries, to provide some information that allows uh, my colleagues to get some estimation of the fisheries catch. So by doing this in the global scale, really covering all the coastal countries, um, the CRS project is able to give us an a, a, a improved estimates of the global fisheries catch in the world as well as in different ocean basins. And so if you had to kind of provide a quick snapshot of mm -hmm. the main results, because I know that there was a recent publication in Nature a few weeks ago, mm -hmm. what would you say is the primary result that came from that recent catch restriction that was just finished and published. So one of the major findings from the catch reconstruction um, that was published uh, 
this early this year was that um, it confirmed the um, the hypothesis that my colleagues put forward is that uh, the lending statistics that are reported in the, by the United Nations is only a subset of the total catch that are actually removed uh, from the oceans. So if you look at the total global fisheries landings, um, in the last couple of decades is around 90 uh, million tons. But uh, what my colleagues estimate uh, in the CLS project's catch reconstruction is that it can go up to 120, 130 million tons per year. And uh, so there's a substantial differences that would lead to uh, a, a different perspective of how much impact and how much uh, how much uh, biomass we are actually removing from the oceans. And uh, in many cases, particularly in, the, in developing countries or in tropical countries, a large part of those missing catch in the, in the official statistics uh, came from small-scale fisheries or subsistence fisheries. Uh, it also shows that um, in the uh, previous day, we often uh, miss or underestimate the contributions and importance of those sectors to the global fisheries, and thus um, in, in a loss of policies or in the assessment of how important fisheries are to, to local economy or uh, human well-being. So I think that's another important contribution from that work. And wouldn't you say, in addition to capturing the subsistence and small-scale fisheries, mm -hmm. another major benefit of the Sierra Andes project was the contribution of illegal and unreported catch as well? Yes, certainly. Um, and um, so that's the in illegal and unreported catch, uh, particularly the unreported component is often a um, a very a big piece m missing piece of uh, a puzzle in understanding global fisheries um, because um, the uh, there are various reasons for the unreported catches it maybe because it's illegal or maybe because it's um, it doesn't uh, it, it the um, it doesn't it missed the it, it, there were gaps in the uh, information collecting systems in uh, by, by countries and by understanding the scale of the of the estimation and and particularly understanding how much of the catch is unreported um, then um, it helps us to identify what the causes of that is and also to help inform the countries as well as the United Nations to provide uh, some uh, advice on how to uh, fill those gaps and how to re reduce that problem and so this Global Catch Database is mm. one of the base data sets that you then use in your own models. Mm. And so you can, can you describe which aspects of climate change you then incorporate into modeling the effects of climate on mm. the future of fisheries? Yeah. So it, climate change affects uh, fish stocks in, uh, in very generally in, uh, in, in two pathways. One is affect the distribution um, of the fish stocks. Another is affecting how much they, um, the abundance and how much they are available for fisheries catch. Uh, we know that uh, marine fish and shellfish, they are sensitive to temperature and other ocean conditions. And in general, uh, with ocean warming, species will be shifting to area where they can find cooler place to live. Um, so particularly in this case in general towards high latitude regions in northern hemisphere they will be shifting towards the pole or in some cases moving into deeper water um, so that's one aspect another aspect is that the ocean's productivities will also change and because um, the ocean productivities from the from the uh, primary productions or from phytoplanktons actually would affect then how much biomass will be produced by the fish and thus the catch and so that's another pathway of how climate change will affect fish stocks and overall, um, this will then uh, shape um, the fisheries in terms of uh, where the traditional fish stocks will be uh, find, will, will be able to find. For example, um, in uh, northern uh, in the U.S., uh, particularly in the East Coast, uh, cod stock is shifting their distributions to a highlight to region. So it means that fishermen that traditionally targeting cod will now have to move further. Um, to find um, to, to change the fishing grounds, as well as um, the some of the cod populations will also, particularly in the south, may suffer from the warming waters, and thus they reduce in productivity. So both of these will affect um, the fishermen that are relying on these resources. And you're describing this temperature effect, mm. where fisheries might be migrating poleward mm. into cooler ocean temperatures. Yes. Is there also potential that there will be zonal shifts, or potentially going into different microhabitats, but within the same latitudinal region? 
Yeah, it does. Um, so at the uh, more uh, regional and um, uh, smaller scale, there are lots of much more complexity because uh, the ocean is very. Uh, uh, there were lots of um, differences in terms of oceanography at, at, at the regional level. So there are uh, something we call microhabitats or um, area that um, are pockets of area because of various reasons, uh, the environmental changes that are uh, uh, that will be uh, affected that will be um, driven by climate change will be relatively smaller compared to other areas. So that provides area of we call it a climate refuge for some species to actually move into and survive in those pockets of area. And there are also complexity in the, more complexity in the way that, uh, for example, uh, the water temperature will change um, in a particular finer scale location. So it is not only that um, speci- uh, northern area will be, uh, will be um, there will be a change in the um, temperature that are um, that are along a, a latitudinal gradient. In some ta- in some cases, uh, some of the temperature changes may be uh, horizontal or more more uh, along the lat- uh, longitude or from the east to west. Um, so species will also changes their distributions according to those uh, more uh, regional um, uh, differences in temperature. And for those latitudinal shifts, if you had to give a rough estimate. How fast are fisheries moving poleward? Um, our estimates based on the, um, historical uh, record shows that species are moving at, on average for fish. Uh, it's uh, moving around 30 kilometers per, per decade. Um, and that's actually also matched with our modeling work, which shows similar magnitude of rate of grand shift um, under the uh, business as usual scenario. So it means that if um, global warming will continue to occur uh, like what we have been observing in the last few decades, then um, the rate of grand shift will continue. Uh, species that we find now will be uh, around uh, 30 kilometers or more uh, um, poleward uh, from, 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 uh, from what they are distributing now. And this is also an average. So some species are moving much faster, while some species are moving um, slower. So uh, particularly species that are more mobile, um, they actually can shift much faster compared to species that are really um, reliant on a particular habitat that they cannot actually move much. For example, some of the shellfish species, their, their mobility will be much smaller compared to a, uh, a tuna species that ta- they can swim uh, f- rapidly. And so I was wondering if you could explain this dynamic bioclimate model that you have constructed mm-hmm. and what goes into that dynamic bioclimate model? Mm-hmm. So th- uh, the dynamic bioclimate envelope models um, is a computer simulation model that we develop um, to in order to inform us uh, the potential responses of marine fish stocks to climate change. Um, and uh, it's, 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 um, it's, it's, it's not a crystal ball, so it won't tell us or predict exactly where a fish will occur by what time and by this time of the year um, will be in the future, but it gives us an understanding of the potential uh, patterns of responses that we will see uh, for fish stocks in terms of changing distributions and abundance under climate change. So there are two um, main components of the uh, of the model. One is the changes in the ocean conditions. Uh, we actually obtained um, the projected change in ocean conditions like surface temperature, bottom temperature of the, wat- of the oceans, um, oxygen, salinity, and uh, acidity. Um, there are uh, co- our colleagues uh, developed a global earth system model that make projections of how those uh, factors would change under climate change. And then um, we, in our model, we take those um, projected change in ocean conditions. And then on another component of the model, it actually uh, model the biology of the fish stocks, uh, how growth, how reproduction, how distributions and populations will be affected by all these changes in ocean conditions. And p- by combining these two components together, we can then make projections of changes in fish stocks uh, around the world. So in our models, we've applied that to uh, more than a thousand fish stocks uh, in the world. All of them are exploited by fisheries. So we can say, uh, give this gives us an understanding on the patterns of responses of uh, commercially important fish stocks to climate change. And what do you think is still missing from the model? 
Yeah, I think one aspect that is missing um, is the um, human dimension, um, particularly. So there are uh, two aspects that um, will uh, that are important in terms of the understand getting the, the full pictures. One is in terms of uh, additional human drivers, driving forces that are affecting the ocean ecosystem, and how that then would interact with um, the climate change component. So this include. Um, different uh, way the fishermen are fishing, um, also different impacts such as uh, pollution, uh, coastal defilement and things like that. Um, so by, and then we are trying to, we are now moving to the direction of trying to see how these cumulative um, and, uh, impacts of different human activities may moderate um, the impacts of climate change on fish stocks. At the other side, uh, we also want to note um, then the uh, impacts of these changes to human society. And that uh, this will be uh, through a different pathway. For example, through the economy, how changes in fish stocks would affect uh, the economics of fishing and thus the, the, the amount of benefits the society can, can get. Another dimension is through, uh, through for example, uh, contributions of fish stocks to, um, to nutrition or food security of coastal communities. Great. And so, one question that I have is what do you think that the model is particularly sensitive to? Is there a kind of pieces within the model because there's so many different parameters and different cycles and kind of models within models that are being integrated together. What do you think it, the, the, the overall model is particularly sensitive to? Um, the model is actually very sensitive to, um, to um, the, so we, 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 in terms of sensitivity of the models, uh, we can divide them into three types, for example. One is random variations of the environment. Um, that we cannot, we, it is difficult to predict, um, like uh, the the El Nino, uh, Southern Oscillation, those kind of things. Another layer of uncertainty is about the models, the way we develop the models, the way we uh, we we put uh, different uh, numbers into the model, that will affect our outcome. And the third component is uh, what we call scenario uncertainty. That's um, the, um, the the changes that we assume the society or the way that uh, fishing will occur uh, or the other changes of the human activities will occur that will also affect uh, the, the response of the system to, 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 to global change. So, so far what we find is that um, in the time frame of, um, of the uh, 2050s, um, and um, some of the, uh, the scenario uncertainty, particularly from fishing, play a really strong part of that. So fishing has a really dominant effect on affecting fish stock abundance and, um, and, and their uh, sustainability. So that's one component that, uh, that would be uh, important to explore is uh, how that understanding of how fishing would change in the future. Um, but then um, setting that aside, Another component that is uh, sensitive to uh, at the um, mid-century timescale is um, is the combinations of the um, the different structure of the models as well as um, the natural variability. But if we look at the end of century timescale, then uh, the climate scenario becomes so important that uh, some of those uh, variability because of random fluctuations and because of the way we structure the models becomes relatively less important compared to the signal or the, the effects of um, greenhouse gas emissions on the marine ecosystem and fish stocks. Interesting. And so from my reading of the model as a total novice, I have seen the factors that go into parts of the climate models and see that there's this focus on temperature primarily and then salinity and a few other factors, but I was wondering if you could talk specifically about whether or not you intend to model things like ocean acidification and coral bleaching events and how those will also affect fish and fisheries. Yeah, that's a very good question. So the ocean acidification is a, is a whole big area of potential pathways of carbon dioxide emissions uh, impacts on wind ecosystem. And we are starting, and we, we are, the amount of information that are generating from the scientific communities on ocean certification is really increasing rapidly. And so we are starting to try to incorporate those new informations into our modeling work to test the implication or scale up the implications of ocean certification on, the, on, the, on the marine ecosystem and fisheries. So, um, and uh, that really relied on the collaborations, particularly with uh, biologists who does 
who do experiments on the effects of ocean vacations on animals. So for example, in one particular study, uh, we collaborated closely with colleagues who did uh, experiments uh, on the effects of ocean vacations on uh, coastal ecosystem, particularly on the field shellfish. So they set up something called a mesocosm. So it's like a, a, a simulated environment uh, for these organisms and see how uh, this organism will respond to a uh, different level of ocean acidification. And then we took those information and um, put it into our models and see how those changes or responses uh, at a much smaller scale may scale up at a big scale. In this case, uh, we look at uh, the impacts of ocean vacations um, on the UK um, marine ecosystem. And what we find is that there will be um, a, um, a ocean vacations actually add to the impacts of climate change. and. Um, potentially drive um, a few species of uh, shellfish to um, to disappear mostly from the U uh, British, uh, from the uh, UK coast. So that's um, an example of the direction that we're going in terms of uh, ocean acidification. Very interesting. And so it, when you were describing the model and the sensitivities to the model, you had mentioned that the model is particularly sensitive to scenarios. Mm -hmm. And can you describe the way that you have created scenarios, whether they are kind of bounded scenarios or optimized scenarios, mm -hmm. and kind of the thought process that went into creating those? Mm -hmm. So, so far, um, our a lot of work are using very, fairly simple scenarios um, of the future. Um, so in, uh, we divide uh, three types of scenario. One is a business as usual scenario. So it means that fishing will maintain in its current rate. Uh, so we say that fishing will not change that much. The, f uh, the amount of fishing and the, the amount of fish that will be killed by fishing, uh, or the proportion of fish that will be killed by fishing is remain constant. And then that scenario is, um, is an, a, a more pessimistic scenario where we will continue to overfish the stock. So we, the fishing mortality and fishing effort will continue to increase at around 2% per year, which is, has been observed in the last few decades. And then there's also a, a more of optimistic, uh, conser conservative scenarios of um, of reducing fishing effort um, to meet the um, the the maximum uh, to to meet the level that would produce the um, the the maximum sustainable sustainable catch from the fish stocks. Um, and so that's kind of the first kind of scenario that we we we, we use. And uh, in some of the other works, uh, particularly when the work is focused on a specific uh, policy, policy forum, uh, we then uh, use that to mold or to, f uh, to formulate our scenarios. So for example, uh, with in the last couple of years, we did um, a, an assessment called the Global Biodiversity Outlook, uh, which is a, 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 an assessment to inform uh, the Convention on Biological Diversity. So in this case, uh, we utilize some of the existing global scale environmental scena uh, scenarios um, that have been developed by, from other global collaborations and initiatives. And then we contextualize those scenarios for fisheries. So for example, there's a scenarios of uh, the, um, the technology driven scenario. And then uh, we use existing information to um, from the literature to then contextualize what it means, what a technology-driven scenario would mean to the fisheries and how that would affect the, uh, the fishing effort um, on, on different components of the ecosystem. So from there, we can then uh, look at uh, different these global scale scenarios and uh, look at how the implications of these scenarios to global fisheries and fish stocks. So I want to bring you back to an earlier part of our conversation where we described the reconstruction of this fish catch data set. Mm -hmm. And you had described that between 1950 and kind of the mid-2005, 2010, uh, there would be this kind of, there had been this mass proliferation of fish catch and that it had somewhat plateaued mm -hmm. starting in around mid-1990s. Mm -hmm. And yet, between 1950 and 2010, there's been an exponential increase in fishing effort. Mm. And so I was wondering if you could tell me what kind of likely future you see mm. with regard to fish catch. Yeah. So for uh, fish catch, um, I th if we look, as you said, if, uh, if you look at the trajectory of global fish catches, uh, if we have already passed the peak. And uh, in fact, if we use, uh, the, if we take the perspective from the new reconstruction, catch, catch reconstruction data from uh, CIWAS projects, fish, global fisheries catches has been decre slightly decreasing in the last decade. Um, 
it also suggests that we are we've already reached the overall capacity of fishery production. It's like um, the concept of peak oil. We have already uh, reached the peak fish, at least for the tra tra traditional fish stocks that we are exploiting right now. And um, so it also means that um, for the traditional fish stocks, uh, even if we continue to increase fishing effort, we won't be able to extract more fish from the ocean. Um, and even uh, and and conversely, uh, it may actually reduce fish catch because of of overfishing. So um, the on the other hand, if we were able to uh, reduce uh, fishing capacity, uh, reduce fishing effort, particularly for those uh, fish stocks that are already overexploited, we can actually we we um, rebuild some of the fish stocks to its um, most protective state. So there's uh, a chance that we can at least uh, make our fish stocks uh, stabilize without further decrease. So let's envision a bleak scenario mm. where fishing effort stays the same and that fish catches begin to decline even more than they have over the past decade. And in conjunction with your climate models, which mm. suggest that in some areas, particularly around the tropical belt, mm that there could be somewhere around a 50% reduction in fish catch. Mm -hmm. What do you think that that means in terms of food security for people within this kind of tropical region around the world? Yeah, so it means that they will, there will be less fish available for them. Uh, our model project that um, and with climate change, particularly with the business as usual scenario, along the tropics we will see a more than 30% uh, decrease in overall fish catch in a lot of places. Um, and um, some of those areas, um, many of those areas have a really strong dependence on fish catch, uh, particularly for coastal community, uh, both economy as well as for food. Um, so in this case, uh, it means that um, they have to deal with a situation where um, they, their available fish stocks will decrease by uh, more than a quarter, and, um, and that um, they they cannot deal with it by fishing more because uh, uh, a lot of the fish stocks are in those waters um, are already at the maximum capacity. Um, so it's is a it's, um, th th it also it then poses a challenge for those uh, fisheries as well as communities to deal with those changes, and um, uh, either through adaptations or uh, uh, in some way or um, for. Um, and, and ultimately, what we need is to uh, reduce greenhouse gas emission, which is a would cause of the the, the changes or uh, decrease in uh, productivity along the tropics, um, in order to um, help mitigate those impacts. And so, greenhouse gas reduction is one solution to rehabilitate mm -hmm. fish stocks. But what are some other ways in which we could be rehabilitating fish stocks that would have a kind of more indirect impact on food security and human nutrition? Yeah. So. Um, other ways of doing that is that uh, is another way that has been discussed a lot is through adaptation. Uh, we know that even if we do start to get our acts together, we just uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, the, the oceans will continue to change because it's a big system. It's like a big, uh, fast-moving chain. We cannot stop it immediately. If we apply the brake, it will continue to go for a while. So, uh, so it means that there will be changes in the oceans that we have to deal with anyway. And one way to cope with that is to do adaptation, and that's a a a, uh, uh, a uh, there are lots of um, discussion now about what would be the best way to adapt to changes. Uh, there are lots of uh, international initiatives about um, adaptations at the human side, um, as as well as trying to better understanding of how uh, fish stock can adapt to climate change. And one of the things that has been raised a lot in general is to diversify, um, for example, livelihood, so that uh, coastal communities may not be so much dependent on the particular resources. Rather, in this case, when the particular fish stock is decreased, then um, there are um, some alternative way that they can keep their livelihood going um, and, and, and thus minimize their impact. For example, there's a studies in um, in the South Pacific looking at the vulnerability of the uh, South Pacific regions uh, to climate change. And one of the suggestions um, that uh, the paper uh, concludes is that, for example, in some regions where freshwater agricultures may actually benefit from a warmer temperature, 
it may be uh, it may be a, a an option to actually help coastal community to um, to to develop some way to access to those uh, potentially uh, expanding livelihoods such as freshwater agriculture to compensate for the loss of potential loss of uh, their income as well as for uh, fish catch from the uh, from coastal fisheries. Aside from human and kind of ecological adaptation, what do you think is the role of policy and management in potentially preventing some of these bleak futures? I think that's very important. Um, uh, ecologically, um, by managing a, an ecosystem well, um, the sensitivity of the ecosystem to climate change will be uh, lower. So for example, uh, there's a, a really neat study in uh, Tasmania that compared the, uh, the uh, changes in species composition uh, rate of range of species uh, within a protected uh, marine protected area where fishing is not allowed it, uh, to with uh, areas that are outside of the protected area. What they find is that uh, changes that they have seen in the, um, in, in the marine protected area is uh, significantly lower compared to areas that are exploited by fishing. So it gives us some uh, evidence that suggests that by managing the ecosystem well, uh, Building up their uh, natural capacity to deal with the changes, um, we can reduce the sensitivity of the fish stock and ecosystems to environmental change. Um, and also, um, there is um, in 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 terms of uh, management, um, the there is also increasing the effort put into design better designing uh, fisheries management and conservation measures that are adaptable to climate change. In this case, for example, um, marine protected area, um, there can uh, people are starting to think of, think that uh, and, and do planning of marine protected areas by incorporating information about the potential change in fish stock, so that they can make sure that um, the protected areas will be effective even with uh, some of the changes that we would expect to see uh, in terms of changes in biodiversity, changes in fish stocks because of uh, climate change. So we spoke about one potential impact on human health through nutritional pathways where a reduction in available fish could lead to deficits in animal source food intake and reductions in certain key micronutrients. But what about thinking more broadly about health in terms of what fish can also bring into kind of a human exposure? So toxicants or pathogens and what role you think climate change potentially has or future fish scenarios might play in bringing some of those toxic exposures or pathogens into into human exposure yeah i think that's very important and that's a fairly a very new topics that are we starting to get a glimpse of grip of what these interactions with the, all these uh, different pathways of impacts of climate change will have on the, on on human society through seafood so for example um there is uh, some evidence that for some of the um, the um, disease uh, that are associated with seafood, um, there may be an increase in the in the, in the risk because of ocean warming, such as uh, cholera or uh, or um, or in some cases um, the um, the. Um, in a risk that is associated with particular um, ex, uh, uh, particular planktons um, that would lead to um, harmful algal boom that would then affect um, coastal fisheries, particularly shellfish fisheries. Um, and um, for example, um, the um, there is a reason. So la in the last couple of years, um, the North I Pacific has been particularly warm, um, and um, I there are some suggestions and evidence that suggest that that may be related to the increase um, in. The, in um, in the incidence of harmful algal blooms uh, along the British along the coast of the uh, the west coast of North America that lead to substantial impacts on coastal fisheries by causing the fisheries the need to coast the fisheries because of the I potential impacts. So I think that's um, those kind of there's certainly I think uh, exist those pathways of impacts uh, through disease uh, through um, harmful algal blooms um, to seafood. Um, and then there's also the, uh, the potential interaction between uh, contaminants and pollutants uh, and like bioaccumulations through the food web to fish and thus affects uh, the health risk to, uh, on, uh, to human consumption. And that's an area that is starting to try to understand. There's, theoretically, there may be some pathway where um, increase in temperature 
um, and that may actually affect the um, the concentrations of some of the contaminants in the seafood, um, and thus increasing the uh, exposure of uh, humans to do, to the risk of actually consuming those uh, those uh, contaminants through seafood. Uh, but I think more research is needed in that area too. All right. Thank you so much, William. No problem. Yeah. <laughs>